Hello, everyone. This is Martin Patella, Life Enthusiast Podcast, the internet, radio, and television show. Today, we're uh, having the pleasure of visiting with Spencer Feldman, the CEO and Chief Formulator at Remedy Link. Uh, Spencer comes with a very important message. Spencer, much like myself, had to develop his method outside of the mainstream. He is not the classically trained medical scientist. He has come to his wisdom through the hard school of Knox or learning on the, in the field, which from my perspective is way more valuable because when I was trying to get help with my medical problems, I certainly did not get them from the well-trained professionals. Maybe he can tell us more about it. Spencer Feldman, good day. So I thought today we might talk a little bit about vascular disease or heart disease. You know, what causes it and what kind of things we might be able to do to put ourselves on a track to healing. Yeah, indeed. Well, vascular disease, that to me would be the most popular way of ending your life prematurely in North America, in the Western industrialized society, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, trying to figure out what's going on. One of the first things I remember reading was that humans are one of the few species that get heart disease. Uh, let's see what you have is um, guinea pigs and fruit bats and monkeys and humans are an anomaly. Out of the 4,000 mammals, uh, only these four don't make vitamin C. And uh, what it's called is a, is a pseudogene the glulonolactone oxidase gene is what makes vitamin C. In us, it's a non-operating gene. That's called a pseudogene. So to give you an example of a pseudogene, uh, we have the genes that code for tails and fur, but they don't operate. So that's what gives us our human form, yeah. Uh, I don't know if the kind of people that end up with like uh, that kind of Wolfman syndrome or people for whom maybe that gene's turned on. Right, I've heard of people with a vestigial tail, for example. Sure. So there are pseudogenes that we don't want on, like, you know, I don't want a tail, but there are some uh, pseudogenes that I think would have been good if we had fully functional. Uh, one of them is the one that does urate oxidase, which is what lets a person get rid of uric acid. And because that's a pseudogene in humans, we have a propensity towards gout. Right. Uh, another one is the photolysase uh, gene which is what uh, allows the DNA to be repaired from UV damage. And we don't have that gene running, so we're prone to sk uh, skin cancer. And the one for the uh, vitamin C is not an operating gene. You go oh, every step except the last one, and then we don't have that step, and so we don't make vitamin C. Right. Yeah. I, I guess I would, I would put on the margin here that our creator was pretty sloppy. Well... Uh, to be fair, what we do have instead is a spectacular vitamin C recycling system. Uh, our red blood cells are different from most other animals in that on the surface of the cells uh, or in the cell, there is a mechanism to recycle vitamin C very efficiently. So we don't need that much, but we need it. I believe this is the entryway for explaining why heart disease is so common in humans and so rare in the animal kingdom. If you, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to take your audience on the path of discovery I took about trying to understand why we have such a tendency towards heart disease as humans, uh, how that progresses and what we can do about it. Before you launch that, I would just like to preframe it with the following. The uh, heart disease is very prevalent. People, most people don't know that they have it. In fact, many of us, the first warning we receive is a fatal heart attack. Mm. So it's not that you think you don't need to know or you don't need to listen to this or you can ignore what's coming in this message. In fact, most of us should pay attention because even so-called healthy runner guys who are 52 years old and are named Mr. Fox, all of a sudden keel over and they're dead in the middle of their very popular life. Poof. That actually almost happened to a triathlete friend of mine. And I'll, exp and I'll explain exactly how that happened. So 
a few things to understand. Um, when plaque develops in an artery, it's not as if it's like material in a pipe where it's accumulations in the pipe. It's in the wall. It's in the actual wall of the artery that the because the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, because the wall is made of layers. Yeah. And so the plaque doesn't sit on the inside of the pipe, but between the layers. Exactly. Yeah. Between the adventita and the media and the intima, that's where the plaque grows. You can see plaque forming in very young kids. The medical establishment will define it as plaque at equal to or greater than one and a half millimeters. But that's an arbitrary number. It's something that we're just prone to as a species. Let's talk about what's actually happening, why it's happening, and what we can do about it. When you look at plaque in an artery, and I, I know you know that I do a lot of ultrasound with clients, and you know, the first thing I'm gonna look at is the carotid artery and you know, plaque and calcium and all sorts of junk are in people just walking about. I believe uh, if you look at where you're going to find plaque or disease in the vascular tree, in the vascular system, it doesn't show up equally in all places. You're going to see it mostly in places where an artery has a sharp bend or a bifurcation or branch. Yes. Now, if you look at a river, places where there are bends and branches, the flow is more turbulent. You have eddies, you have swirls. That's the first clue as to what's going on here. We're gonna come back to that in a second. Now, blood has to be in a balance between being too thin and being too regulated. Too thin, and a person has hemophilia, they can die from a paper cut, they can hemorrhage. Too coagulate, and that oxygen isn't moving back and forth, and there's other problems. And from my experience at doing blood work with people, when I used to look at their blood regularly, under a scope, a large number of people were slightly too, quite a bit on the coagulated side. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, stress will do it, inflammation, infection, but tap water can do it. And let me explain how this happens. When the municipal water supply utility wants to clean the water before it sends it into, into the pipes for drinking and such, they flocculate it. And what that means is they're gonna put aluminum or something in it with a very strong positive charge to make everything that's floating in the water stick together because then it's much easier to filter it. The problem is, so what, they, and so what they've done is they put a positive charge on the water to make it all stick, okay? And then they filter it, but we drink this water that still has this positive charge and it flocculates us. Our bloodstream, all the little floaty things that are supposed to be separate, all stick together. Now this is exactly how a clot happens. When a person gets cut or injured, the body changes the, the releases things that will change the electrical potential of the blood so that it flocculates, it sticks together. So what ends up happening is because of stress and diet and the water we drink, we're all on the flocculating side, we're all on the sticky side. And if you look at blood on a microscope and you take a drop and you let it sit there and you look at it for five, 10, 15 minutes, eventually you're going to see it clot. And what you'll see is these network of fibrin spicules and the platelets and it turns into the, this, this mass. You're watching the crystallization of the blood. So a lot of us are walking around with blood that's partially crystallized. And the issue with this is the crystals are sharp. They're abrasive. Now, remember I said that plaque shows up at places where there's turbulence, at the forking and at the, at the curves. What I believe is happening, Martin, is that the blood is abrasive. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to swirl in certain areas. Now, one last part to this equation is the arteries themselves are coated with albumin, which should have a negative charge. The blood is negative, the artery is negative, everything repels and nothing scrapes. It's like a nonstick coating. But when we make our blood more positive, not only do we make our blood more abrasive, but we, we get rid of the negative charge in the arteries, can't repel the blood. And where that swirling happens, we basically sandblast our arteries 
from the inside. Yeah, it makes sense. You're, you're raising points that we usually would talk about, like Zeta potential, where uh, the Zeta potential, in my mind, is the concept of all the particles being charged in such way that they are creating a perfect colloid, that all the particles within the dispersed fluid mm -hmm. are repelling one another in the perfect manner. Is that, yes. is that the same sort of it's science? The blood should be a colloidal solution, and the municipal, uh, the water utilities reverse, uh, in the process of clearing their water, make their water non-colloidal. Mm. And what I would like to see at some future point is that the water uh, utilities of the future, after they've flocculated it, after they've cleaned it, put the negative charge back on the water. To your well, question. Until they do, you know, until they do, we here at Life Enthusiast have a solution for you. Number one, filter your water. Number two, uh, treat your water with the prills, as these ceramics that we have that actually help discharge all of this electropositive agglomeration yeah. and causes the water, water causes, uh, forms latent liquid crystals. And it's the positive and negative ends of each water molecule, the H and OH ends. They tend to connect with one another. It's a weensy spider kind of making little globs. And when we discharge that, it behaves a lot like as if you were taking a pin and prick these little balloons and they pop and disperse. And so after you're done treating with water, you end up with something like I have here, which is, this is my water bottle with uh, fulvic acid but it's it's been treated yeah. anyway that's what i pack around the house yeah. and uh, it has we have measured four things that we know that happen with the water that we discharge using these crystals which is the surface tension is lower the ph the acidity drops towards alkaline the orp drops towards negative uh, millivolts mm -hmm. and finally the cluster size becomes smaller, the resonance is lowered. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all that, so until the municipalities solve this problem, I'm just here testifying that there is a solution. Yes, yes. So we have this bloodstream that is abrasive. The arteries no longer have a shield. They no longer have their negative protective shield. And then there's locations where it's swirling and that abrades it. And then the lack of ability to make vitamin C in the amounts that we need for repair begin this cascade. So yeah. the next step is, uh, you've heard of LDL, low, uh, you know, low density lipoproteins, that goes in. And it has very, um, it's been demonized. But let me tell you what LDL does for you. Uh, LDL, it stimulates a wound repair and arterial plaque damage is a wound, yeah. Uh, LDL, uh, re uh, it's a growth stimulant, it's a growth, kind of growth hormone, so it reinforces and stabilizes the area. And LDL stabilizes the fibrous cap, which is that one or two cell layer between the plaque and the bloodstream. Now, the reason it's doing this is if that fibrous cap were to burst and all those inflammatory foam cells and everything were to come out, person could stroke from an emboli. Um, if the artery wall weren't strengthened, then the person could hemorrhage again. So the LDL is trying to protect against hemorrhage, and it does a great job. Uh, the fact, so LDL doesn't cause heart disease, but is the body trying to deal with it. But as it's dealing with it, what it's doing is the growth of the arterial wall narrows the, 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 the tube, and now there's less blood getting through. You had a, you were, there was something you wanted to say. Right, yeah. Well, <laughs> number one, it reminds me of the body work repair on automobiles, putting Bondo on the injuries before we paint it. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of image in my head. But the point is, indeed, we are chasing the ambulance instead of the problem that caused the accident, right? Like, well, you know, yeah, and you know, the plot thickens. Okay, so the body's doing LDL to make up for the vitamin C loss. Well, what's it gonna do 
to, to deal with the LDL because now the, the plaque is going to start to grow and grow and grow. Right. Okay. You may have heard of people who said that they had a 95% blocked artery and didn't know. The heart cannot survive, you know, uh, a section of the heart cannot survive on a 5% coronary flow. So what's, and then you have other people who dropped out of a heart attack with arteries that are 20, 30% blocked. Right. So, so here's the mystery, right? Mm. And here's the answer. The body in its great wisdom says, yes, yes, I'm going to seal up this artery. And yes, yes, it's, it's going to decrease the amount of blood going through. Relax. I'm going to give you a natural bypass, a natural bypass operation. I'm going to take some of the capillaries that are nearby. I'm going to grow them, right? Yes. And I'm going to expand them so that they can now act as bypasses for the blood to get around what may end up being a completely blocked artery at some point in time. One other thing you'll see, and I like uh, that I, and especially it's easy to see on ultrasound, is you'll see a line of calcium uh, in the arteries. Hardening. Yeah. Now the heart is not, from an engineering perspective, large or strong enough to move all the blood. No, no. There are, it, it is moving blood clearly and timing things, but there are other things that move blood too. The muscles are, when they flex, especially uh, the calf muscles, help with the venous return of blood from the legs. Yeah. A huge player is the diaphragm. And as it comes up and comes down in breath, it's creating positive and negative differentials in the, in the thorax and the torso, which suck in and push out more blood. So a matter of fact, this is how giraffes with their really long necks are able to get blood to their head. It's not their heart alone, that won't do it. So we've got the breathing as part of the heart, right? Um, and then I believe that the arteries themselves, peristalsis, like intestine, that they squeeze. And I think what happens, it's just my theory, is that as a pulse of blood goes through the artery and stretches it, the artery responds a split second later by squeezing. Right, so it's an elastic, elastic involuntary pre-programmed. Uh... Exactly, so let's say that this is the, the pulse of blood, like, there we go, like this, right? Yeah. As the blood, so as the blood, as the pulse is going, yeah. right over, right, so the artery is expanding, and then it squeezes and ends up pushing it. And as yeah. you can imagine it, squeezing it, squeezing it through the artery. Yeah, yeah, the peristalsis, just like in the gut, except this time it's in the artery, right? In the arteries, right, because arteries have muscles on them. Right. So uh, between the venous return from the muscles and the diaphragm and the heart and the arteries, all of it go towards moving the blood. But if the arteries have been calcified, if they've lost their flexibility, right, that's what pulse wave velocity tests are, then right. it can't squeeze as much. Right. And now we've lost one part of our circulatory system. Okay, but that should lead to low blood pressure rather than high. What it ends up doing is the heart then has to make up for that by beating harder. So now, you know, and if someone's calcified, then their membranes are less flexible, less permeable. So right. the heart's going to have to push harder to get things from point A to point B. So, and the artery. So now you're putting a double whammy on the heart. Right. So, to treat right. them. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So the systolic has to go up to make up for the hardening. Yeah, which is why you'll see pulse pressures increase, the systolic yeah. and diastolic. But and I imagine the diastolic's coming up too. The whole system starts to starts to have a problem. All right, man. So, so now let's. So now let's talk about the flaws in the, in the body system, right? The body says, well, we don't have vitamin C, I'll recycle it, still not enough, I'll fix it with LDL, block that artery, I'll make a collateral vessel. Okay, sounds good. But two issues. Uh, one is we still have to deal with the fibrous cap. And if someone is taking an LDL inhibitor, then they're doing nothing to, and the, the cap on the, the plaque can become unstable, and if it ruptures, that's an issue. Uh, the other flaw in the model is what happens if a person doesn't make collateral vessels? So as an example, I have a friend, he's a triathlete, and 
he had ended up getting two stints put in. And, uh, you know, he was trying to understand what's going on. And what we finally figured out was that he had uh, lead poisoning from shooting at an indoor shooting range and mercury poisoning from contact lens solution. Lead and mercury inhibit collateral vessel growth. So if you have toxic metals in the system, the body may not be able to grow new blood vessels. That's where you get somebody who's got that 30% blockage that keels over and dies. The, some, the guy who's got the 95% blockage and doesn't know it, he's full of collateral vessels. So huge thing is understanding that the collateral growth must be protected and nourished and nurtured. Indeed, you put your finger on something really important. Somewhere in our original design, I'm speculating that somewhere on the savanna, there were no mercury or lead deposits, and we were just not exposed to any of it, and we have no detox pathways that successfully deal with that. So here's the, uh, here's the smoking gun, I would say, to this. I talked about metals uh, causing problems uh, with collateral growth. Let's talk about chemicals. Uh, there's a chart, uh, many, and we can put it up right now. <clears throat> and this is the chart showing heart attacks in the United States in the last century. And what you'll see is that it, it's pretty steady up until the 1930s. Yeah. Then it's coming up, peaking in 1960. And then it's coming down, 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 down ever since. <clears throat> Here's another chart. Here's a chart of cigarette smoking. In the right. United States. Yeah, correlated, yeah, correlated so perfectly, it's not even... Right, now put one chart on top of the other, yeah. and you can see this is the same chart. Yeah, yeah uh, fully correlated, not 0.9 or something like that, right? So we know that heart attack, uh, we know that cigarette smoking causes heart disease, and we could argue inflammation and all those things, but I, a main driver that I don't think is being talked about is that nicotine, that chemical, that toxin, interferes with collateral vessel growth. So you've got someone smoking cigarettes, they are irritating their system, right? Lowering the data potential, causing irritation. At the same time, they're knocking out their ability to uh, do collateral vessel growth. Right. That's why cigarettes are so dangerous to, to, for heart disease, heart disease, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want LDL to be under 100, but we want it to be under 100 naturally. Right. Um, if we force it down, uh, we just stole the body's ability to control the damage. Well, I mean, I understand the concept. You want to keep it from the. You want to keep that artery open. Right, but that's just like saying I want to keep the uh, fire engines and ambulances off the highway. They cause traffic jams. Well, let's see if we can get the best of both worlds. Let's see if we can do it all. So, uh, let's recap the problem. We have vitamin C deficiencies because we have a pseudogene. We have low zeta potential. We have, uh, which causes coagulation and um, clumping, loss of arterial protection, uh, wall protection. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the LDL narrowing, uh, causing the growth in, in the plaque, narrowing the artery. Yeah, thickening of the walls. We've got the calcium uh, lining up. That's, that's hardening of the walls. Mm -hmm. We've got the unstable fibrous cap, which is ready to burst and Okay, and then the lack of collateralization. So let me tell you things we can do for, uh, regarding these issues. In terms of vitamin C, go take some vitamin C. It doesn't take much. Remember, we have a spectacular capacity to recycle it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a day-to-day -day thing, even just 500 milligrams, uh, I take four grams a day, but even five, uh, 500 milligrams taken re regularly is fantastic. Right. My understanding is that vitamin C has a fairly short shelf life, like three, four hours. So, Oh, and the half-life of the body? Yeah, it, it gets excreted pretty quickly. So it was recommended in other places that we take something in the morning, something at midday, something in the evening, not just one hit somewhere in the middle. Yeah, it's water-soluble for sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, then the low zeta potential. So now we've got this positive charge in our body. And my favorite way to work with that uh, was based on the work of uh, Riddick, who did the original work on zeta potential, and uh, McDaniel. And the solutions they came, they came with was potassium citrate. 
And potassium citrate has a negative three charge. That's a very strong negative charge. And it's able to uh, reinstate that negative charge so the, the blood goes back into colloidal solution, arteries get their negative charge again. If you need stronger than that, EDTA has a negative four charge, uh, which is even stronger, but negative three, staying with it, is um, a good maintenance thing. I wouldn't do EDTA every day, but I would, I would and do take potassium citrate daily. I take a quarter teaspoon and a glass of water three times a day. Potassium citrate, isn't that something that lemon juice would sort of provide? Yeah, but if you want to get the kind of amounts that I think would be useful to counter what our environment is creating for us, I think, um, and mind you, I, I'll do lime and lemon juice too, I mix them. But, uh, and in the absence, sure, go get that. But if you have it, right? So like lime and lemon juice has vitamin C and has potassium citrate. Could you estimate the equivalencies? Like how many lemons would it take to... Uh... You know, I wrote that, I, I did that once and it wasn't enough. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just thinking I, was, I, I need to take a dozen of le lemons a day or something like that to make up for the typical lifestyle. Yeah, what, what, uh, what was suggested in the people that were working with Zeta Potential was a quarter teaspoon and a liter of water drunk once a day. Um, I do three, four times that personally. And, you know, uh, oh, here's something that's interesting. Um, for years, uh, I'd have to go to the dentist every three months because I had so much calcium building in my teeth. I, it was a, you know, this anomaly. And I went back last time and I'm listening to them not scrape anything off my teeth. And I, I'm saying, hmm, do I have less calcium on my teeth than normal? They're like, yeah, you have hardly any. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's kind of a global phenomena of this calcification and not calcification. So let's, uh, let's go through these. We've got the vitamin C, we can take that. I, you know, liposomal vitamin C is great too. You can make that yourself. Um, potassium citrate for zeta potential. If you're really in a hard way, meaning if you need to move very quickly and aggressively, yeah, sure, maybe a couple of months of EDTA. But maintenance potassium citrate will do that. Then you've got the, uh, the actual damage to the artery. How do we supply it with what it needs to be able to repair itself? And uh, chondroitin sulfate has uh, got a great track record as supplying the raw materials needed to do the repair work. Uh, then you've got, uh, what about the LDL? Let's say we, we wanted to lower the LDL but not lose its benefit. Okay, well, mm, Linus Pauling, the only scientist to win two unshared Nobel Prizes, along with his student, Matthias Raff, uh, discovered that uh, it was that when the artery became damaged um, and it's it kind of tore like a bit of fabric, little pieces of lysine would become exposed in the arterial wall. And this is what the LDL attached to. And they reasoned that if you had enough lysine in your bloodstream, it would all attach, the LDL would attach to what was in your bloodstream preferentially over what was in your artery. Now, oh, you mean like wash it out? Uh, neutralize it. Sure, wash it out. No. Yeah. So, you know, this is not a complete solution because it still didn't address the reason why the artery was damaged, nor does it necessarily completely reverse the arterial damage. But in terms of the plaque not growing anymore because the LDL is not getting in to trigger the growth, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. But again, don't just do that without understanding what the LDL is doing for you. Uh, so one thing I like to do to stabilize the, the fibrous caps is go to cola. And that's been shown to uh, make the cap stronger like LDL does so that we're less likely to rupture and have a, an aneurysm or a stroke. Um, another thing that uh, you can do would be um, lysine or, uh, sorry, um, arginine or for some people, citrulline. Uh, is better for them, uh, for nitric oxide production to relax the arterial walls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, up the flexibility. Right. Um, now, we've already talked in other videos about how to detox. You know that I like to use, um, the, we use metacardium and Xenoplex. For, uh, I use, if I'm dealing with metals and chemicals, that's my go-to. Right on. The other thing you want to do is you also want 
um, one thing we want to deal with is um, vitamin K2. Now, you don't want to do heroic doses of vitamin K2 unless you're monitoring yourself because it is a blood coagulant. Uh, so if I were, if I noticed a lot of calcium in the artery and I felt the need to really move quickly, I would do a high level of K2, but I'm going to check my prothrombin time or look at my blood or a microscope and just make sure that I'm not getting too coagulated. And if I see that's happening, either back off the K2 or add in something to counter it. And you know what we've done at RemedyLink is take all of those things that I mentioned, the potassium citrate, the sulfate, the lysine, the arginine, the citrulline, the go-to cola, uh, and uh, the vitamin K2 and natokinase, put them all in one place. And it's something that I take uh, five days a week. I don't think someone should take anything every day because the body needs a chance to bounce back from things. Uh, but as an example, uh, you know, when I check my arterial age, well, I'm 50 and I checked it yesterday and I believe I was 26 in terms of arterial age. And that's not genetic because I got heart disease on both sides of my family. Now, cholesterol is required, the brain is made of cholesterol, it's a base cell, a starting point for all hormones. Cholesterol is, is very important, right? Sterol, sterone, testosterone, estrogen, estradiol. These are all, you know, coming from this base unit. Yeah, all sterols, yeah. You certainly don't want, uh, cholesterol is sort of like a, a global um, anti, you could call it a, a kind of a global anti-inflammatory in a kind of way. Um, when you see it going up, again, the rather than lowering the cholesterol, ask yourself, well, why is it going up? Where is the infection, the inflammation? Where is the toxicity? What's going on that's triggering this? Because, uh, you know, the statin drugs, which, which will lower cholesterol. Um, when you look at the studies that look at the, the, the IMT, the intimamedial thickness, the, the thickness of the arterial wall, um, I didn't see any results for statins until people got to very aggressive statin dosages. And then you would see maybe a few percent decrease per year in arterial wall growth. Right. But at the same time, those, those levels will cause significant side effects. Very high levels of statins. Um, they're going to suppress CoQ10, which is one of the main um, enzymes for life, vitality, longevity. Uh, you know, I, I told my own mother, you know, she, please don't, don't take those. She insisted on it. And, you know, a year or two later, uh, you know, her muscles are, are collapsing under her. And mm, there is some evidence associating statins with, uh, I believe it's a mental. Uh, oh, yeah, dementia. People, people get very stupid. I'm acting as though I was on statins. So I can tell you personally, um, I'm not a doctor. I can't give medical advice. You know, statins are uh, nothing I would ever want in, in my body or near me. Yeah. Uh, I would want to try to understand what was going on that the cholesterol was going, why was the cholesterol going up and what could I do to, to, to work at it from that perspective? Right. From a natural perspective. Right. Well, I mean, from where I stand, uh, I just see it as a very evil ploy concocted by the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, they sell over a billion dollars worth of it annually. And it's uh, causing, I mean, I see it in my uh, conversations with my clientele, and it's causing a lot of problems. I'm glad that there's alternatives. Let's say that. Right. Yeah, well, that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do here. This show is, and this, this website and this channel is about helping people find alternatives to thinking that Symptom control equals healing. The body has an amazing capacity to repair itself. Right. And it's, it's a remarkable instrument. And if you just give it a little bit of help, just give them the raw materials and take away some of the, the stresses on it, it's amazing just how quickly things can start to turn around. Right on. You're failing to mention the name of the product that you're talking about that has all of these ingredients put together. Sure. So um, the name of the product that has all those ingredients I referred to is called Rubiflex. And it's a powder that 
you can just mix a little bit of water and juice. And, and uh, you know, it's been said that humans aren't, that we as a species are not good at risk assessment. And I like a lot of health, you know, people have lots and lots of supplements. And, you know, half of them I try for a little while and they just sit on my shelf and I never finish them. Um, and, and then I thought, well, you know, what, are, what do I really have to worry about? You know, what, what's, what's really the risk here? Okay, well, heart attack's a huge risk. So let me do something for my vascular system daily. And uh, what is the, the, you know, the other big risk, of course, is cancer. So uh, that, th these are to me the two, the two things that, that you know, I, I don't want to become so focused on my health that I have a thousand supplements and I think about it all day long, but I don't want to ignore it and have it catch me unaware in my 60s with something bad. So to me, my balance is I do something for my vascular, vascular system, you know, I do something um, for, um, to deal with the, the human potential for cancer, and then maybe one or two other things that are particular to my body that I might have an issue with, and then I get on with my life. Right. I hear you. I mean, it's, it's the statistical game, right? One half of U.S. deaths right now are caused by cardiovascular failure, mm. and 33% are caused by the broad definition of cancer. So that's, that's a lot. Yeah. That, it, when, you, when you take care of those two most important failures that we have in our, call it des design, I suppose, mm -hmm. or our lifestyle forcing us to deal with that, then that's, that's major. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with you that the, um, the number one insurance policy should be take care of your cardiovascular and take care of your cells living or dividing normally rather than not. So let's, let's just park, park this call here. I think it's uh, just a beautiful spot to uh, say goodbye to our listeners. We have educated them about the cardiovascular system, what they can do about it. And we'll come back in our next segment about the other major health problem. Sounds great, Mark. Cells. So thank you very much. If you want to have more information, come to life-enthusiast.com. Call me on the phone, 866-543-3388. This is Martin Pitella with Spencer Feldman closing out. Life Enthusiast is restoring vitality to you and to the planet. <laughs>